So, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Jones Seminar Series. My name is Lee Lind. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mohammed Haidarinejad. Sorry about that. Um, Mohammed got his uh, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Sharif Technical University in Iran, and then got a master's degree in architectural engineering from Penn State followed by a PhD in mechanical engineering from Penn State, and is now at the University of Maryland uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, but in a specific cluster that looks at the built environment that he will tell you more about. And so um, I will sit down so that you can hear as much from him as possible. The one thing that I would ask us all to keep in mind is that there is a faculty meeting scheduled at 3 o'clock, and so we need to just manage the discussion so that uh, we can finish things in that time frame. And so, Mohammed, uh, let me welcome you again to Thayer School. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. So today I'll talk about context-based design of energy systems in the built environment. I'll explain later what do I mean by the context space and what do I mean by the built environment. To move on the outline of my presentation, so first I'll start from a brief introduction. Why do we need to look at the built environment? What is the shortcoming and my vision to tackle this problem? And the main part of my presentation will be about context-based modeling of the buildings. There are a couple of aspects I would like to emphasize here. First, I would like to start from the energy balance at the context scale, because we all know what is the energy balance or the heat transfer rates when we are looking at the individual systems, how that happens in the context level. Then I'll look at the new physical models. Let's say we are modeling, uh, we are modeling the, the context. Are, do we have enough resources for the physical models or not? If we don't, what do we need to do? And then the part I'll work on the reduced order modeling. So we look at relative significance of the terms. So let's say we have convection, radiation, we have the conduction, latent heat transfer processing. Which one are important in the built environment? And ultimately, I put that together in terms of integrated approach. And at the end, when I emphasize on the context, I'll go through the details. We can look at how those models perform at the individual building level so we can expand it to the broader scale which I hope to do that for the city scale modeling. So let's start from why do we need to look at the context modeling, basically why the results are appropriate. So currently, people are looking at the case study approach, meaning that you have one case study or cluster of buildings, and the result of those, the problem are, are not reproducible and generalizable. So the result might be appropriate for a case study. Let's say I'm modeling this building here. So that would be very good for this building. Can I expand that modeling for somewhere at the University of Maryland or another campus? So the way I would like to see that, I would say there is a need for context-based approach, meaning we need to look at the heat transfer processing due to the influence of the built environment. So that puts into the building into perspective. Are we looking in the building located in the city center, or we are looking at the building located in the rural area, such as an isolated building? So that's the implication. Let's say I'm looking at the neighborhood here at the Pennsylvania State University, so I need to make a model for the airflow around the buildings. I need to make sure I'm accounting for the solar radiation there. I need to make sure I have good energy models for that. So let's look at what is basically the suggested vision from NSF. So those who are familiar with the cyber physical systems uh, for smart cities. So this is a figure I borrowed from the uh, NSF Early Career Award, Early Career Investiga Investigator Workshop that I attended that. So the vision is great. Uh, so we are looking at the buildings here. Buildings are responsible for 40% of the energy consumption. So that's why when I'm looking at the energy systems, I would say building energy systems because buildings are responsible for majority of our energy consumptions in the US. So the vision here, you see that it's, we are looking at the embedded systems, communication between the smart cars, energy efficient power grids. We are looking at the smart appliances in energy efficient homes. There are some limitations here. I would like to emphasize on those limitations. So for example, these buildings we are looking at here, are they located in the city center, located in the rural area? So are we considering the influence of the context? What happens if I build this, this couple of buildings here, or if I build it somewhere else in, located within a city? 
Are we looking at the land cover type? Meaning, for example, here we have the impervious surface, such as the asphalt, or we have the concrete, or we have the vegetation. Are we looking at the influence of that on the energy consumption or not? So I believe there is opportunity for us as a building science community to provide insights to the next vision of the NSF for these smart cities. So that's what I'm hoping to accomplish. And I have a couple of visions for that. So the, to make sure our frameworks are reproducible and generalized, we need to make sure we study the context space, meaning we look at different neighborhoods, try to provide something that could be replicable for other campuses, other neighborhoods, or other cities. I understand there are some limitations. Maybe sometimes that won't work. But for a typical neighborhood, I would say there's, it's possible, I'll show it later, to establish that framework. The other part, when we are looking at it, do we have good thermofluid properties accounting for the, for the physical models or not? Let's say I'm looking at the convec convection in the built environment. Do we have a model accounting for the context there or not? Let's say I'm looking at the efficiency of the cooling systems. What happens if that cooling system is installed on this building here or if it's installed in somewhere in an isolated building? So the heat rejection you have is completely different. So that's what I would like to emphasize in the presentation. The other thing, when I have that model, I need to make sure the model is validated. So I need to make sure I validate that with the on-site measurements. Do I have the strategies, the novel strategies, to make the validation or not? So I would say it's possible to make that, but currently there are not enough you know, um, validation strategies. And at the end, I believe when you have all of these tools and these capabilities, let's demonstrate that and making sure how much those models have influence on the larger scale modeling, let's say modeling it, the campus, providing some initiatives for the campus, providing some uh, sustainability initiatives for the cities. So one of the things I would like to emphasize, why are we looking at the built environment? So this is a graph coming from the United Nations. It shows in 1970, while only 30% of the population, they lived in the urban areas, right now that number is half, and it's projected to be 70% by 2030, meaning we need to have resources. We need to, have, we need to uh, basically equip ourselves with the strategies to design more energy efficient, to design more sustainable uh, communities. So that's why I believe there is a need to look at the built environment, looking at the context of scale. And the other part is we could see the number of cities that you know growing become mega cities, meaning that we have cities with more than 10 million population. So there are a lot of limitations, there are a lot of setbacks when you design those those you know cities. I would like to emphasize here when I'm looking at the built environment and the context level. So still I have this equation, which is the energy balance I have there. So it's the same thing you see probably in the textbooks for the heat transfer, just the, the format is different. So. On the left-hand side, I have the heat generation, meaning the solar radiation. I would say that's the incoming uh, forcing decision maker in the built environment because that's the incoming net solar radiation. Then I have the anthropogenic heat transfer. On the right-hand side, it's just distribution of those heat transfer processes. I have the sensible, I have the latent heat transfer. Let's say I have green roofs, I have vegetated surfaces around the building. So that's basically coming from this latent. Then I have the storage. How much of those energy coming to the built environment is getting stored? So that's another property important. That's why I would emphasize on the land coverage, because if I have impervious surfaces, meaning those energy getting absorbed in, 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 this, in this term. The other term is the advection part, meaning if you have the convections in the built environment. One of the things that's important here I would like to emphasize, you cannot model each of these, these, these terms or equations individually. Let's say I'm looking at this solar radiation. This is coming to the built environment, but depending on what kind of surface you have, portion of that goes to the latent, portion of that goes to the, to the storage. So I, I, I would like to try to see some of the terms being studied individually, but you will see at the end there is a need for an integrated approach. The other thing is, when I'm looking at these terms, I need to make sure I have good physical models to study those. So let's say I'm looking at this, I mentioned before, convection. Do I have appropriate convection heat transfer coefficient to study that or not? If I'm looking at the solar radiation, do I have good models to account for the height variation, let's say, in the buildings when the shadowing happens? So to make sure 
I could generalize part of my research results. I would like to see there are some similarities. I could benefit from those similarities. Let's say I'm looking at the built environment. I'm trying to see how buildings are close or far from each other. If you see here, these buildings have a distance between them. So I would say we could borrow this terminology, urban plan area density. That shows how dense or how sparse the built environment or the buildings are. So you see the equation is here. That's the area, the, the, this roof area divided by the area that for the neighboring uh, buildings. So when the number is uh, it's, it's, uh, high, so meaning that the urban neighborhood is dense, so the buildings are close to each other, meaning we are located within a city center. But if the number is small, meaning the buildings are far from each other, so we are looking at an isolated building. So the equations we have, we need to make sure it collapses into the individual building level if we are looking at the small number. There's another one, I would say the urban frontal area density, that's just the area being blocked by the other building. So I, I want to emphasize on this in this presentation. But here it shows the Pennsylvania State University part of the campus having different urban plan area density depending on how far or close the buildings are. So here for the new physical models, new context-based physical models, I would like to emphasize on two different models, convectivity transfer coefficient, and also efficiency of the cooling systems. A uh, couple of things, I mean, it's interesting. I'm looking at this term here. I'm trying to see if I could make some simplification and produce some models for the convection here. The way I would say I look at it, I start from the main equations. I look at the first principles. Then I look at some measurements. So if you're looking at here this neighborhood, we did on-site measurements. So these are, uh, who are familiar with it, these are IR cameras, you know, the, f the, the temperature readings on the surfaces. It's very obvious to see the windows, the building surfaces, the different colors represent different temperature. Then here we install sensors to measure the air temperature around the buildings. And ultimately, you see here, these are the sensors being installed at different elevation. Then ultimately, we develop the model, we validate it. So I'll go through the detail about how we did it. Looking at the convective heat transfer coefficient, OK, this is the equation we have for a building. Let's say I'm looking at this control volume, uh, control volume around the building. So what, ha what do I have here? I have the solar radiation coming to the surfaces. Uh, it could be two parts, the short part, short wave radiation, and also the long wave, meaning the interaction of the surfaces together. I have the convection, the air the speed, and also the temperature difference create that convection. I have the conduction happening through the walls. So that's the part I would like to emphasize here. If you remember from the heat transfer you know, textbook, usually convection is a function of the coefficient, function of the area, and the temperature difference. Currently, in the modeling, so the way they are doing it doesn't matter if the building located in an isolated location or if we are looking at the city center. So the only thing it matters, they are looking at the force convection, meaning function of velocity, and we are looking at the temperature difference, meaning we are looking at the free convection. So we are trying to mimic the same structures and incorporate a methodology that we could get the convective heat transfer coefficients for the built environment. Uh, one way, it's so uh, who are familiar with the Navier stokes so we have the continuity, the, the, the heat equations, and the momentum equations. So one way, it's to use computational fluid dynamics. So meaning that you discretize the area around the buildings, the air you have, running simulation. Usually, it's very intense. It takes hours, uh, hours of simulations. And then based off that, when you solve, at the end, you get the temperature, the air temperature. Having those air temperatures helps you to get these convective heat transfer coefficient. So if I'm looking at the figures here, so I have distribution of those convective heat transfer coefficients on the surfaces. So this is the legend I have. These are the distributions. It's very good. I get detailed information about the distribution of the convective heat transfer coefficient. But the problem is sometimes if you remember those textbooks, when you're looking at the tables, they're providing you one number. So our tools or our designs, they do not require this much level of details. And I cannot reproduce this for each neighborhood or each context. So that makes some limitations for our studies. So what should we do? The way we did it, so we said, OK, let's borrow the definition of urban plan air density. Let's running simulation for this urban plan air density, meaning trying to put 
um, buildings into different spaces from each other, try to run the simulations using CFT for that, try to see if we could mimic the same structure from, for the equation. Let's say I'm looking at the force convection. This is the existing correlations. I'm just incorporating a term for the urban plan area density. I'm doing the same thing here for the, free, for, the, for the term that has the free convection, incorporating the urban plan area density. So we ran the simulations. We used the regression analysis and the statistical tools to see if we could come up with something. One thing we did out of those uh, simulation and statistical, we see equations emerge. So let's say I'm looking at different surfaces of the building. I'm looking at the wind ward, the part of the building that basically facing the wind. Or let's say I'm looking at the leeward, the, the place back, back to the building, or I'm looking at the roof. So we see here all of these equations, they have the element of urban plan area density. So I don't need to run any more simulations to get these values for a specific context. I could just use the equations here, so no need for additional simulation. That's what I mean by having reproducible and generalized frameworks and uh, physical models. Now I have those, and I validated the model. Let's see how significant those models are in terms of our modeling approaches. So let's say I incorporate those convectivity transfer coefficients into the building energy modeling. So there are two things I would like to look at. It. What is the exterior surface temperature using different uh, convectivity transfer coefficients? And what is the influence on the heating and cooling consumption of the building? So the way we could look at it, I have two figures here. The left-hand side shows uh, different hours here. So each of these spikes represent a day. And then the vertical axis shows the exterior surface temperature in centigrade, so 30s, 40, 50, 60. So depending on different kind of coefficients I'm using, I get up to 9 degree temperature difference on the surfaces. So this has some implications. One of the implications is when the surface temperature is different, meaning the interaction of the surfaces, you have long wave radiation between the surfaces with different temperature values. The other thing, it has implications for the design of the materials. They may have some degradation of the materials because of the high or low temperatures. The other thing it's important, I'm looking here on the heating consumption. So these are different, um, different um, convectivity transfer coefficients for the internal uh, surfaces. And these are urban plan area density uh, equations for convectivity transfer coefficient, different colors. The vertical axis shows the heating consumption, and you do see that there's 20% difference using different equations. So meaning that using appropriate convectivity transfer coefficient that we develop has significant influence both on the surface temperature and also both uh, on, the, on the heating consumption. So to move forward, I mean, this part was for the convectivity transfer coefficient. I mentioned that there are some influence on the cooling system. So here, when I'm looking at the cooling system, uh, COP meaning coefficient of performance or efficiency of the cooling systems. So we are mainly, again, looking at this advection and partly anthropogenic. I'm not focusing here on this part, but I see that has implication here. So again, I would like to say that we start from actual urban neighborhood trying to make sure we validate our model and then deploy it for hypothetical neighborhoods, meaning if the neighborhood, it's because the buildings are far from each other or if you are looking at the buildings close to each other. One of the requirements that we have here, the way we are quantifying this efficiency we need to look at some of equations that quantify the efficiency as the outdoor air temperature, meaning if I calculate the outdoor air temperature, I should be able to calculate the COPs. So looking at different, uh, different publications, we've identified four different categories. First category is for the window package unit. So the correlation is a linear correlation. The second type, it's a second order correlation. So these are coming from the manufacturer data. Some researchers took it, conducted regression analysis, and come up with these equations. The other one is inverse correlations. The other part, you could mimic the same structure as the Carnot efficiency to calculate. So these are the, the resources we need for quantification of the COP. OK. Let me start from what we did. So the way we did it, the first top part shows the experimental works, an actual neighborhood, and then the bottom part shows the hypothetical model we looked at it. 
So for the first part, we made sure we could calculate the surface uh, radiations on the building surfaces. So when we had those surface uh, radiations, we incorporate that into our airflow simulations, meaning how those surface temperature as a boundary condition could influence our CFD simulations. And then when we applied that, we got the surface, we got the air temperature. So this is some distribution of the air temperature. We validated those air temperatures with the on-site measurements. And now when we made sure our framework works here, so we deploy it for hypothetical uh, urban neighborhoods. So we have started to look at those, um, those magic numbers, 0 0.04, 0 0.16, 0 0.25, 0 0.44. So we are trying to see if there are some patterns there. Let's see what comes up. So when I'm looking at the efficiency, so it's important how those egg cooling systems, they heat, reject heat to the outdoor. So that's why I'm looking at the uh, exterior uh, temperatures of air. So here I have a graph. The horizontal axis shows the urban plan area density. So meaning here, this is an isolated building here, meaning I'm in a city center. And the vertical axis shows the outdoor air temperature. So I have three different lines here. One of them, uh, the diamond one, represents the windward wall. This one represents the roof. And this one represents the leeward. Something is interesting. If I'm looking here, uh, meaning I'm looking at the windward, so the number is close to 35 here. And here it's close to 38.5. So I'm, I'm seeing almost around 4 degree temperature difference just with the, with the built environment. I'm lo not looking at any design aspects. I'm not looking at any s stratification. In some of the Asian countries, the way they are designing these window package units, they are installing on the top of each other. So the heat rejection from this one could come up to the other one and de decrease the efficiency. So I'm not looking at that. I'm just looking at the influence of the surrounding buildings on the air temperature. The same thing could happen for the roof. So you see at, at, at most there are 1.5 uh, centigrade temperature difference looking at different neighborhoods. Let's incorporate that into the COP equations I showed in, in the table. So if I'm looking at all of those um, uh, equations I have, I do see 17% reduction in the efficiency. So here again, it's urban plan area density. Here, it's a, it's a non-dimensional variable. So if it's less than one, meaning the efficiency decreases. If it's more than one, meaning the efficiency is higher. So for the, for the roof and for the windward, I do see some reductions in the efficiency. This is 10% reduction on average. If I make the average for all of those equations, it happens for the windward. The same thing happens for the roof, 7% reduction. So this is showing how we could create something reproducible because I could make some estimations depending on my building context scale. So so far I showed how we could develop some new physical models. Let's look at a little bit broader scale. Let's look at the energy balance again at the context scale. This is the bird's eye view for the University of Maryland campus. And here I'm looking at this neighborhood, these four buildings. And here, uh, it's a couple of slides I would like to emphasize on the solar radiation, latent storage, and also the advection part. So this is more integrated. I'm trying to cover more terms in the equation. So one of the things that's important in this study, I mean, uh, it's applicable for most of the campuses, we are trying to look at also pervious and impervious surfaces, meaning looking at the vegetation, or we are looking at the asphalt or concrete. So I'll show it later how that could have influence. The other thing it's important when you're doing this study, you need to make sure you have good utility data for the buildings because at the end, when you're looking at the energy system, you need to validate your energy consumption with something. I mean, most of the campuses are saying, okay, we have meter data, but you'll be surprised to graph those data and see nobody looked at the data, so, and there are some you know, metering issues for a year of the data. So that's why it's important to make sure you are looking at the data in advance and before doing the research. This is a part that we again did some measurements at the University of Maryland trying to measure the on-site air temperature at different locations and different elevations. So here if you look at it, that the same neighborhood. So we are looking at shaded versus unshaded. We are looking at pervious versus impervious surfaces. So here, for example, I'm looking at unshaded. I'm looking at the combination of grass and concrete. Here I'm looking at unshaded and the combination of the concrete. 
The way we did the measurements, so these are the sensors you see for the air temperature measurements. We installed them at different elevations. We uh, recorded the temperature for different uh, different uh, hours of the, the week and different times of the year to make sure we have the measurement. And one of the things it's possible, so now we did the measurements, now let's look at some of the validation. So these are the thermography images showing the surface temperatures for those locations we have. A couple of things is interesting. I mean, it's difficult to see in the images here, but if you look at the legend here, we do see up to 15% temperature difference on the surfaces, depending on if we're looking at the shaded versus unshaded, and if you're looking at the pervious versus impervious surfaces. The other thing, these could serve as boundary conditions and validation for our airflow modeling. So here I have two graphs for those two of the, the locations. The horizontal axis shows the air temperature in centigrade, and the vertical axis shows the height. So we do have measurements at different elevations, and this line shows the accuracy of the sensor. So for most of the part, the simulation results are within the accuracy of the sensors. But the problem is, for the surfaces, we do see some differences. So you see that here, it's a huge difference between that. So I believe that's why our models are failing. So we are not accounting for appropriate solar radiation into the uh, study. So let me explain that one a little bit more. So solar radiation, if I'm looking at it, so let's say this is just imaginary building, I'm looking at just a one-story building, so there are a couple of things. If you remember from the heat transfer books, you need to have the view factor, how those faces are seeing each other, and then depending on the combinations, you may have different combination of shading and unshaded surfaces. So meaning some of these faces you see here, partly is shaded and partly not shaded. So how do we account for that? Currently, the models cannot capture that. So we, we try to use something novel. So we try to represent the building surfaces as different small patches, I would say, different small. I mean, this is obvious. For each story, we have one, basically, patch. But for this one, it's one meter by one meter, meaning on the building surfaces, we have a small patches. We could calculate the heat fluxes. We could calculate the surface temperatures. So that shows the numbering that I'll use for the next slide. So uh, here in the next slide, I would like to show you that the influence of the patch sizes, because when you are making the average, you have combination of the shaded for the surfaces and the shaded one. So here I'm looking at one meter by one meter. Those smaller squares are one meter by one meter. The other one is two meter by two meter. The other one is just one, basically, uh, patch per story, 10 meter by 3 meter. So it's basically this one. One meter by one meter is this one. So a couple of things that it's interesting if I, I would like you to pay attention. So if I'm looking at June or September, just look at the number, how those numbers are significant. This is the incoming solar radiation to the built environment. This is 150. This is 750. Just look at the magnitude. The other thing, let's say I'm looking at this uh, surface 8, which is this one. So because of the uh, modeling approaches I'm using, I could see up to, I mean, this is around almost 600. This is almost around 180, or I would say, like, let's say 300. So at least I see two times difference in the modeling approaches. So that's why we cannot have good predictions, because uh, we are not accounting for appropriate modeling approach. The other thing, somebody might say, OK, so far you were looking at the buildings, the same building height. So this is good. I mean, we are looking at the same height. It's applicable for some cities. Let's say I'm looking at the DC. Because of the height limit for the buildings and the, the regulations, they almost have the same height. So it's applicable to deploy this uh, strategy there. But if I'm looking at different heights, let's say I mean, I'm looking at one edge, meaning the surrounding buildings have the same height as the building of interest. The other one is 1.5, meaning the surrounding <coughs> is 1.5 times of the building of interest. So I do expect some shadowing on the, on the building surface. And then it's 2. So the same, the same time, June 21st, September 21st, and again, the same variation on the, on the, on the, the value, of, value of the heat flux as incident solar radiation. But look at what's happening here. So almost when it's 2H, meaning the surrounding building is higher than the the building of interest, I do see six times difference in the solar radiation receiving by the surface. 
So that's very important. I need to have good models to, to account for that. The same thing happens here. You do see the, the huge variation. Now let's take it further. Again, I mean, I have those radiation data. I could e deploy them into the airflow models, and then I could see what's happening. So here I would like to emphasize on these two figures. And these numbers, these lines, represent three different strategies if I'm using Energy Plus, it's a tool supported by the Department of Energy. If I'm using DAVIM, it's a tool that accounts for the solar irradiances. Or if I'm using assumptions on a fixed temperature for the surfaces. What do I see? So this is the air velocity. So the air velocity on the horizontal axis here in meter per second, and the vertical axis shows the height. So I don't see that much variation in the air temperature, meaning I could easily predict the air temperature without no problem. But what's happening here? The problem is here I do receive different, basically, um, results. So that's one of the reasons there are opportunities. We need to make sure we have good models. We need to sure we have good on-site measurements. We need to sure we have good case studies to validate which one is more accurate than the others. So that was the part I would like to emphasize on the solar radiation. Let's look at what the latent heat flux could be. So if I'm looking again at the equations, I'm trying here to focus more on the latent part. So the way we looked at it, so I, had, I was fortunate we had a couple of group members. They extensively work on the green roof trying to create a model, validate the model. And then uh, one of my colleagues deployed the model into the energy simulation tools. And I took it further and implemented it in the new version of the simulation tools. So that model, it's very good. It accounts for different variation of the green roof and vegetated surfaces. So it's a combination of this uh, solar radiation and the distributions here. Let me show you some representative, one representative figure here. So I'm here looking at the heat flux. Uh, here you see that this is the latent heat flux I have on the vertical axis. It's watt per square meter. Horizontal axis shows time in hours. And each of these basically uh, uh, times shows one day if you're looking at the spikes. I do see some variation between the heat fluxes. Let me explain what are these. So I'm looking at vegetation for the, for the plants, uh, and I'm trying to change the leaf area index. Some of you are familiar with the nexus of energy, water, and food. So let's say instead of using green roof, I'm using lettuce for that. So the leaf area index is different than the amount of surface covered by the, by the plant. So probably that could be higher, could be in the order of 12, 14. Let's say I'm looking at different plants. So the leaf area index, it's smaller. It's 8, 6, or 2. So I do see some variation between the heat fluxes. But the problem is when I'm looking at the cooling and heating consumption of the models, I just see only 5% reductions or increase in the model. So that, that, that won't show up. So what are the implications? Why I just see only 5%? Let me explain why do we see that. That goes back to my original statement. We are not using integrated approach. So the problem is, let's say I'm looking at different heat fluxes. So the surface temperatures are different. So when the surface temperatures are different, the long wave radiations are different. When those are different, the, the heat rejection of the cooling systems and heating systems are different. So that's, that's uh, something that we are not accounting right now. Let's say I have different kind of land cover types and roof types. So here I'm trying to put some visions how we could account for that. So they are not already being accounted right now. We are looking at the individual aspects, what we don't have this all together. So that's what I think we need to look at some case studies. And campuses are good because the location could provide actual case studies. We could also tie that one with the renewables. A study shows when you have green roof next to the PV panels, your efficiency of the PV panel increases. So this has some implications. So let me put this sum together. So I would say context-based reduced order modeling. One could say, what is reduced order? So I would use the terminology coming, I think, from Stanford. Computationally inexpensive mathematical representation that offers potential for real-time uh, real real analysis. So I won't go through the details here, but I would say starting from the neighborhood, considering all of these aspects, airflow modeling, solar, incorporate that into the model, and then getting the energy consumption <coughs> of the building. So that's my vision that could be happen for this study. 
So now I did that. So let me see if I could use some of these and automate the process, how I could deploy this at the broader scale. Let's say I'm looking at the University of Maryland campus here. So the idea is we have complex geometries. How could they account for the building shapes? How could they basically represent them with typical shapes? The other things, I'm not very interested in having manual creation of individual models. I'm interested in automating the process, making generalizable, making reproducible. So that's what I use for, for my PhD dissertation, trying to automate the process. I'll show it later. So I believe there are some typical shapes, and we represent these shapes. Uh, uh, these buildings with these typical shapes, for example, cross shapes, I could automate the process to create a, like a quarter of a pie, or I could create the rectangle shapes. <coughs> so we did an extensive study looking at the four different campuses. Two of the campuses are located more toward uh, bigger cities within the city. Uh, so we were looking at UMD, Penn State, Harvard, and Portland State. So these are the typical shapes. The horizontal axis shows I could represent those buildings with these kind of shapes, L shapes, rectangle shapes, S shapes. So these are, I would say, typical shapes. And then the vertical axis shows the percentage of the buildings that we reviewed. So one of the things interesting, more than 80% of the buildings in these four campuses could be represented with these typical shapes. And the other thing is more interesting, if I'm looking at the rectangle shape here, Harvard University and Portland, because they are located more in the city centers, they have more rectangle shapes. It's, it's the same thing. We were looking at the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey coming at the national, national wide. So we do see the same thing more on the cities. So we have more typical shapes, especially rectangle shapes. One could ask what happens with the remaining 20% of the buildings. I would say we could use the combination of the shapes uh, to create those buildings. So when I emphasize on the larger scale modeling on the context, let me talk about a little bit reduced order modeling. So I'm going from the context, going to individual building, and say how we could quickly create that models. So I have the geometry. Now let's see what I could do. The idea was I, I was able to define something that rapidly and accurately cre could create energy simulation models uh, and automate the process. So one could ask why this is important. I would say two different things. So one of them with this approach is possible to model a large number of buildings or it's possible to look at a large number of energy efficiency measures. When I say a large number of buildings, let's say I'm defining some sustainability initiatives for city or for campus. So I could easily create the models for the campus and provide some baseline. I do understand there might be some differences, but it's a good starting point. The other thing, let's say I'm trying to define some goals like 20% reduction in energy by 2020. I need to look at what kind of energy efficiency measures I'm looking. So I could quickly create variations for those buildings in terms of the lighting retrofit, HVAC retrofit to create that. So the idea was I benefited from a tool, I would say Open Studio Application Programming Interface. I would say this tool will revolutionize the building energy modeling because it's object oriented uh, and you don't need to, I mean, you are just playing with the, with the codes. And those who are familiar with the MATLAB, the way I lay out the, the structure is I have a method uh, or in the MATLAB I would say a function to create the geometry. If you give me some key information about the building, I could create the geometry. I could add the window if you just give me what some kind of key information. I could create all of these aspects to, to create the building. And so for example, who are familiar with the HVAC loop, easily I could create the HVAC loop. I could create or modify or remove any, any equipment there. And with that, uh, I saw that it's possible. Let's see, I'm, I'm modeling this pie shape. Uh, so one might say, OK, why are you looking at the pie shapes? Because sometimes in the building, if you're looking at the combinations, you may have half of the pie shapes connected to a rectangle. It's very common to see that. So one way it's I discretize this exterior, basically, uh, the, the, the exterior part of the building with 100 points. One idea is to, uh, to have 25 points. The other one is just have a polygon, meaning five points to represent this shape. So let's see what are the implications if I'm just going with these different strategies. So here I have two graphs. The right-hand side shows the uh, energy consumption coming from the simulation. The right-hand side shows the time for model creation and also the time for simulation. So depending on the number of points I use here, it's like 
this is the first one five, this is 25, this is 100, the simulation time increases drastically. So you see it's just basically exponential. And looking at the value here, what happens to the simulation results? After a while, it just gets flat. So there is no need to account for that complexity for the geometry. As long as I have good models here, I don't need to go further with the points. So this is one strategy that could be helpful. The other thing is, let's see, I'm looking at this actual case study. So I have a detailed model. These two models are very detailed, and we created those just uh, manually, so there's no way to automate it. Detailed, 15 minutes time to make the simulation, seven minutes for some simplifications, and if we reduce it more, we, we, have, uh, we could reach to two minutes. Here on the right-hand side, I have a complexity matrix that I developed. I don't go through the detail, but basically it's a it's an automated process to account for the complexity of the building energy model. The vertical axis shows the accuracy. So from the standard, if I meet and I be within this line, the green line, my model is accurate enough comparing with the actual building energy data. So I do see here, after adding more complexity, so this model ac actually meet the requirements I need. So I don't need this detailed model here I have. So this is another implication why we could use reduced order modeling. So here, I would like to emphasize what are the implications. So if you're interested, I would re recommend anybody go to this page and look at it. Uh, my, at the University of Maryland, we, uh, in our team, so I had a good colleague of mine use the Google Map API to, at the front end. And on the back end, it's my code. So we could represent the building. So the, the code here and the tool allow you to create the buildings on the building footprint. So let's say I'm modeling this building. I could just go over this building and create the building, or I could go over this one and create it. Uh, I, I, I won't go through it, but this is one of the legacies I would say it's coming out of our NSF projects, making sure we have a tool that could be used for research and teaching element. Currently, four campuses, they are using it for the classes, so at UT Austin, at Colorado School of Mines, and these are the universities that are using it. So, and we are hoping more universities to use that, and we are not expanding it so far because we are trying to test and make sure it's working. So the other thing I would like to emphasize on it, so what kind of inputs do I need for the reduced order model? Some, some, some might say, OK, you have the models, but how you're accounting for some of the inputs? I would say there are some ways I could use the numbers as a proxy. So for example, I could use the utility data to make some uh, estimations about the operational schedule. I could use building construction or building age as a proxy to get the installations. I could use the building size or number of occupants. I'll show it later how those could be beneficial. So some of the part we did to make sure we could account for energy efficient buildings, it's um, looking at the lead database who are familiar with the uh, green buildings uh, and energy and environment design. So leadership in energy and environment design lead buildings are very famous right now. So we looked at their databases. We looked at 134 office buildings. We tried to see if you could come up with some strategies to conduct a statistical analysis, having the inputs, and just making sure those inputs go to the reduced order model. So anybody in future just could use the tables and put those into the models. There is no need to run any more statistical analysis there. So the reason we selected, because most of the campuses, they have initiatives to make sure the building is LEED certified, or at least meet some of the requirements of the LEED certification. So a couple of things I would like to emphasize from the results. So one thing we did, we looked at the cluster analysis, and three different clusters emerged, low energy intensity, medium, and high. Since we are interested to get some key information, the low energy intensity tend to have a smaller building size. The size is half. So that's something very interesting. So the way it happens, there might be working on a smaller building. So in that way, you have the surface area for the roof are smaller. So in that way, if you have a good insulation for the roof, you can minimize the heat transfer through the walls. And that's exactly what we saw here. If you are looking at the next figure here, this is the roof you, you value. So if you're looking at the median here for the low energy intensity, it's compared to the other cluster, it's lower, meaning they are using better roof insulations. And the other thing is they benefited from the lower window to wall ratio, meaning they minimize the, the amount of windows per, per walls. 
here I would like to emphasize on something that could be very helpful because there are so much studies on the occupancy of the building to try to get some um, models for that. So one of the things I, uh, we did in the group, I worked with my colleagues, so my, we installed different occupancy sensors for the building. And based off that, looking at the uh, studies here, so let me go through this figure. So it's the plug load here in KW. This is the number of occupants. So it's very interesting. The receptacles or plug load has a linear correlation with the number of people. So if you give me the number of people, I can give you what's the estimated value for the um, plug load consumption. The other thing, if you can give me the electricity utility data, this is the electricity data for different time of the year, and this is the value of electricity, I could create some heat maps. And out of the heat map, you can see something emerge. So these are the operational schedule. If I'm looking here, the building starts operating around 5 AM and goes till, uh, I think, 10 PM. So that's something very interesting, because I just, from the utility data, I can make some uh, some inf uh, make, make some suggestions about the building models and some inputs. So with this, I would say, OK, I have everything. So now let's see what is the future for the work I could do. I could look at the city scale modeling. Sorry, these are not showing here. But basically, I would say we could borrow this terminology from geography, looking at the urban train zone, so meaning at the city level. So what kind of neighborhoods or context do I have? It's a city core. I may be near to the city core. So there are different classifications for that. Let me see if I could deploy that one for some cities. So let's say I'm looking at Seattle here. So these are different UTCs I saw here that we, we identified. And actually, this is the image I took from that. So it's the storage area. So it's very similar to the definition. But the problem for the building energy modeling, it's just not identifying these UTCs. The building principal activities might be different there. There might be some key information that's missing. So there are opportunities for some work to make sure that we could adopt this strategy and expand it to the next level. So that's what I would like to say for future research ideas. Uh, it's possible to make those um, first principles to develop reduced order context-based models for CPS of a smart city. So that's a topic I could be tied with the renewable energy, with the sustainability measures, with the electric vehicles. And I'll explain a little bit in one slide. The other part is I could say we could look at the land cover type. So what are the influence of that? So I feel this has some implications for optimization of the energy systems and um, design of pervious versus impervious surfaces. So for example, for the first topic, I would say I could look at the different neighborhoods in the city. I could make sure I quantify the influence of those uh, those uh, urban neighborhoods. I could make sure I have a large scale modeling for that. And I could define paths required for the carbon neutral initiatives. Uh, we could empower the neighborhood with distributed energy systems. Because if we have the energy predictive model for that, we could make it happen. We could look at different sustainability measures. We could try to optimize the energy systems, especially focusing on the buildings. And ultimately, one of the things might be possible when you are looking at the cities, so they may share different neighborhoods, but at, at some point, I believe there are similarities. So we could develop database of solutions and just borrow those values instead of running just blindly simulation. For the other topic, I said uh, energy and land cover. So I believe we could look at this. You remember these patches, solar radiation as a driving force. We could try to see, for example, this patch represent the green. A vegetated area, this could represent asphalt, this could represent windows on the building wall. So we could look at the influence of the solar radiation, short and long wave, depending on different temperature surfaces. We could look at different sustainability measurements, looking at the historical data, or looking at typical and extreme conditions. So with this, I would like to summarize. Um, so in the presentation, we looked at the need for the context-based reduced order modeling of the building energy systems. I showed some need for new physical models. And also, I showed that how it could be used for convective heat transfer coefficient for the efficiency of cooling systems. And I showed how we could quantify those influences. And at some part of the presentation, we look at um, relative significance of each terms. And also, I proposed that we could look at some uh, at the broader scales, since we are looking at it right now in College Park, Baltimore, and Washington, DC. So it's possible to deploy it for, um, at the city level. So with that, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, the sponsors for the work. Uh, it's a big team. We work on it for more than um, seven, eight years. And 
with that, I would like to open the floor for questions. You should feel free to recognize people. No, I don't need to do that, so just go ahead. Yes. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned that you want to optimize the energy system to future work. Mm -hmm. Uh, we could look at different so different kind of buildings. So let's say I have laboratory buildings, I have uh, office buildings, and I could look at the context space. So these are the building energy systems, but we do have, let's say, equipment in the building. So we have distribution of the heating and cooling, I would say, the HVAC part. We could have the distribution of the lighting. So they have different energy communities. Some of them are coming from electricity, some are coming from natural gas, some they may come from distributed steam or chill water. So we could look at optimization of those basically energy communities. So I prefer to put the buildings at the center. Now with the collaboration with the colleagues, we could look at the renewable energy generation. We could look at how a smart grid could interact with the buildings. But I foresee if we have a good models for the buildings, and I would say predictive models for the buildings located in the city center, it's possible to interact with different basically strategies. Yes. So if you take a step out, um, some of this research looks a lot like uh, looking at the urban heat island effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, we haven't looked at the city level. That might be a little bit the scale different because when you are looking at the city level, the urban heat island, so the scales might be a little bit larger. You're looking at maybe meso scales or something else. So it's possible to look at that, and there are models for that. But I believe um, uh, they would say devils are in the details. So we are trying to look at the details because there are so many good models for the urban heat islands, but what exactly happening in that small neighborhood? So we are trying to make sure we understand those parts and then we can deploy it to broader scale. Yes? I, I like the way that you defined um, the plan area um, ratio and the frontal area ratio, and I wonder, or I, I guess I got the names right, I wonder if there's not something similar that would be more generalizable at the building level rather than having to think about all these shapes. Is, couldn't something like surface to volume ratio or something like that be appropriate enough rather than having to worry about whether how many points it's got in your in the plan? That, that's a good idea. I tried to look at at some point looking at the exterior surface area per volume of the building because those are the heat transfer. Nothing emerged out of that. Maybe there's a need for additional work. But the other part could be, you know, there should be a matrix when you're looking at the, the solar radiation and looking at different building heights. So we couldn't come up with a measure that I could generalize it. So how much the building height should be and how I could correlate it with the solar ir irradiance on the building surface. That, nothing emerged, emerged so far, but there should be some way to do that. Mm -hmm. and, I'm and so, did you like? Do you have those, or is it? Uh -huh. Did you dumb it down for us, or is it uh, really more? So it's possible. Because I would, I would just expect it to be used more, more generalizable. If you did it in so one of the things it's possible, yeah, you could go with those non-dimensional variable like Nusselt number, Reynolds number, trying to. I mean, you have the H, you have the H, so you can put it in the Nusselt number because it's H A over K. So you could easily get the Nusselt number. The problem is when you're trying to incorporate that into the models, they're not asking for the Nusselt number. So we do have those graphs as a Nusselt number, but it doesn't have implications right now in the approach that we are using. Okay. So then your graphs have, like, is it like Nusselt number as a function of, it's going to be Reynolds, Rayleigh, Prandtl, the area ratios like Mark was talking about, your area ratios, maybe the surface volume ratio, maybe a height difference between this building and the next one, yep. angle incidence of the sun. It seems like there's just almost an intractable number of parameters. There, there. They are. So that's, so I mean. I mean, one thing is possible. I mean, we try to look at like the pi Buckingham theory. Try to see if we could come up with some non-dimensional parameters. I think there is a need for additional studies because I showed that there are different ways to model the solar radiation. But so far, when we are working, nothing emerged that could be reproducible, same as the CHTC. So for that one, you saw that here in the in the table. 
so I could say, okay, this is the correlation function of airband plan air density, but for the solar radiation, we worked closely with a couple of colleagues. We couldn't come up with something to say, okay, for the solar radiation, this is the equation I have for this surface. So far, nothing emerged, but I agree with you. If we have those, let's say, the solar ir incidence of the, if we have the height variation, if we have some of those thermal, just put it into the pi bike income. Let's see if we could come up with something. But so far, nothing came out. Yes. <laughs> A lot of what you're looking at is the exterior surface heat transfer in the building. If you think about the building as a whole, it's a very complex system. There's heat transfer on interior surfaces, mm -hmm. heat transfer through walls, there's all kinds of heat exchangers in the HVAC system. What was the motivation for picking the exterior surface as the, the primary focus here? Or am I interpreting that right? Uh, the, there are two things I would say. I mean, first, we were trying to look at the context, influence of the context on the building, so we need to look at the exterior part when we are looking at that. The other part, why we are not looking at the interior, because if you are looking at the reduced order model, the aggregate energy consumption of the buildings, you could get close to the actual you know, utility data, let's say monthly data. I do understand if I want to do renovation and retrofit here for this specific room or the other room with the windows, I need to have detailed thermal zoning for the model. But if I'm just looking at the aggregate data for the building, just having some estimations about the heating and consumption of the building, Usually, it's possible with the reduced order model to have a fairly good uh, simulation results. So that's what we are trying to push forward, that if you are just looking at the aggregate data, you could go with the reduced order model. But if you're looking at um, detailed retrofit options, let's say changing the, um, the lighting, and even the lighting fixture for this room or changing the windows for this specific room, I believe the model fails there. So. Uh, that's why we are trying to focus on the exterior and also on the, at the building level, just account for those key parameters. Because you saw from those heat maps, the schedule, it's, it's possible to identify the operational schedule, even with those deficiencies in the systems. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, can you go back to uh, one of those slides that had like the, uh, the buildings and the, the surfaces of the heat transfer coefficients? Um, um, this it, it looked like they were generated from uh, from CFD. Uh, this this yeah, one. Something like that. Yes. Can, can I just sure. So uh, I'm going to you know pose an analogy. One one of the things that we we see in renewable energy integration, mm -hmm. uh, let's say wind turbines or uh, solar PV, what you do is you have a look at over the course of let's say the whole year. What is um, the intensities of all the, all the winds or the directions of all of the winds? Um, same thing you would do with solar, solar PV. Mm -hmm. um, you, you would look at you know, uh, where the placement of the sun, sun is mm -hmm. over, the course of, over the course of the day and uh, maybe something about uh, cloud cover. So when you're doing a simulation like this mm -hmm. and then following through with the methodology that you just described, how would all of your results change if you are going to be uh, changing the, you know, the intensities of the wind, the in intensities of the solar radiations, and their and their directions? Yes, that's a very good question. I mean, I didn't put the assumptions we made for the incoming velocity here. We have started from the weather data, having the wind rows, so we identify what is the predominant wind direction. And usually, if you're looking at that, so a couple of uh, basically directions emerge with the velocities. So the one that we use here, it's the predominant basically wind uh, speed and direction for the simulations. And we are trying right now to working if we identify eight different directions and eight different basically and predominant wind speed and direction, it's possible to generalize it. So that's currently what we are working on right now. So that makes sense if we are having those databases looking at identifying some key moments. It might be possible something emerge out of that. I mean, I don't have the answer for it now. I guess the, the question I'm, I'm trying to mm -hmm. get to the heart of, you've done a lot of detailed modeling here. Um, to try and get these heat transfer coefficients. Yes. And I want to know what the changes are in these heat transfer coefficients if you were to uh, more holistically get a sense of, let's say, your windrows mm -hmm. um, and you know, change the directions or look at you know, the probabilities of all the different uh, winds. H how much does that impact in relation to 
all of the new effort in modeling that you've done? So uh, the way I could say that, so for that, let's say for the temperature difference, we looked at three different temperature difference for the convectivity transfer coefficient when it's five degrees between the surface and the air, 10, 15. And also we looked at variation of the velocity. So when I say said here, we are trying to mimic this correlation. So the way we did it, we ran it for different those combinations you mentioned. And then out of those combinations, running uh, regression analysis to get the correlation. So they are already embedded there. I, I agree with you. For some specific uh, instances, it might not be possible to use these correlations. But for some general ideas and general purposes, it's possible to just rely on these, these correlations. Okay. So um, I'd like to thank you for a perfectly timed seminar and for the effort you put into it and all of that. So let's give our speaker a hand. There may be more questions, but there's some other things that need to sure. happen. So thank you, Mohammed. Thank you.